Good evening, and thank you for joining us on this beautiful afternoon. Um, it's hard to call people in on a gorgeous October evening. A uh, reminder to si silence your phones to everybody. Um, my name is Liza Bernard, and on behalf of the Dorman Williams Public Library, I welcome you to this special event with Meg Pokras and Jeff Friedman. And I want to thank our co-host, the Yankee Bookshop, who donate a portion of the proceeds from book sales at these author events um, to the library so we can continue bringing you more programs. And also to Woodstock Community Television for recording the talk. It'll be available later on their website and ours to share with your friends and fans. Um, <clears throat> we are excited to welcome Meg Parkrush, who is visiting us from Scotland. She is the author of nine collections of flash fiction and two novellas in flash. Her work has been published in three Norton anthologies and hundreds of literary journals, including, and the name of some of these journals that you've both been published in cracked me up, but uh, Electric Literature, McSweeney's, Washington Square Review, and Passages North. Uh, traveling to Woodstock from much closer by, I'm pleased to again introduce Jeff Friedman, who I have had the pleasure of hearing read numerous times over the last couple of decades. Um, Jeff's poems, many tales, and translations have appeared in um, many publications, including American Poetry Review, New England Review, and Poetry International. He's received an NEA Literature Translation Fellowship and numerous other awards and prizes, and his 10th collection, Ashes in Paradise, was recently published. So, flash fiction, prose poetry, short stories, not labels we use very often, but um, in Armour's Toe's introduction to the Best American Short Stories 2024 O. Henry Prize Winners Collection, he wrote about um, how special and wonderful the role that surprise can play in short stories as compared to novels. And with Jeff and Meg's readings, I am sure we are in for some wonderful surprises. Yeah, it's true. Some of the magazines, as they get smaller and smaller with microfiction, all, like Drunken Frog and Seas Cows, the, the magazine titles are funny themselves. You know, they start to be a little questionable. Um, so um, I'm going to, a, a micro, so just for you two, if you know what a micro story is, I don't know. Um, it's usually considered a story of maybe 300 words or under one page or under. There's some variation. Some people think of 400 words. And um, I kind of, am, I feel like I write prose, I write micro stories. And I'm like, really, I'm in that, in a Venn diagram, I'm kind of in the circle in between. I mean, I'm, I'm sort of walking that middle all the time, I think, going back and forth between the two. And a lot of, um, in the new, the newest book I have, like Broken Signals, a lot of the pieces kind of look like this on the page. Um, so, um, and many of my pieces have been published both as poems and stories. So I'm going to start out with um, um, a piece called My Mother's Dress Shop. And um, that was published as a poem and in Best Microfiction 2023. It's, um, I grew up in St. Louis, Missouri, and my mother had a dress shop in Midtown. And uh, it was a small little dress shop, like one room. And whenever there was a truck coming in when I was a teenager, I would go uh, help unload the truck and then break down the boxes. So this is kind of, uh, this is about kind of that experience. Um, break down the boxes that held the clothing, stuff them into the dumpster in the alley behind the shop. Break down the racks that held the sexy dresses, the leather coats, the French lingerie, until they are just rods and wheels lying in a corner. Fold up the clothing neatly. Break down the counter, the shelves, and the cash register, empty of cash. Break down the shadows that no longer places. Break down the light that drops through the window like a message until it is just a scrap of light. Break down the dust that clings to the walls and counters your mother attacks with a cloth and windex. Break down the mannequins until they are disconnected limbs, head, and torso. Now there is only the memory of a memory. Counter, its tail ticking back and forth. The nurses in white uniforms peeking in the windows of air to spot a skirt or blouse on sale. Your mother's voice coming back to you, 
like the smells of a fresh sweet roll and steaming black coffee, and the blaze of sun that makes it impossible to see. So I'm going to maybe read a couple of comic pieces out uh, at this point. Again, another piece uh, is sort of been published as a poem and as a prose piece um, called Spring and Air. And um, this recalls the early days of the pandemic. You may well remember when um, everybody was afraid to go into the grocery store and everybody was masks were omnipresent. And I think I sort of wrote that I recently went down to a birthday party in New York and I was at a bar for the birthday party. It was a jazz bar, cool little jazz bar. And I knew I was going to get COVID. <laughs> And I did. I came home with COVID. My wife and I both came down. About two thirds of the people in the bar came back with COVID. And it was a little bit more serious case, actually. So anyway, I just thought about it. And I, I had written this a while back, so I thought I'd read it, call it back. Um, OK. Spring in the air. In the checkout lane three at the grocery, I feel my nose twitch inside my mask. The two carts closest to the cashier are six feet apart. But the rest of us are much closer together. While some shoppers chat briefly, laughing at jokes, while some lean over their carts for support, and some pull out hand sanitizer, rubbing their hands briskly, I scrunch my face to hold back a sneeze. When the guy in the next lane asks me a question, I begin to answer, and without warning, the sneeze escapes. I'm shaken, but quickly hold up my hands and shout into my mask, allergies, I'm not sick. But the other shoppers look at me as if I'm dangerous. Before I could do anything about it, I sneeze again, and my mask sails off like a large butterfly, floating over heads until it lands on a grocery conveyor belt two lanes away, touching an avocado. The cashier removes the mask with her gloved hand, the shoppers say no to the avocado, which the cashier places near her register. The other shoppers move as far away from me as they can. I try to reassure them, but a third, even more powerful sneeze explodes from my mouth and nose. The automatic doors open. The plexiglass windows shake. The shoppers hit the floor, holding their breath, their hands a sea of droplets and aerosols hanging over them. There's no way for me to clear the air now. For a long moment, the store is silent. The only other person standing is the cashier in lane five. She smiles and signals me to come ahead. But I'm not next in line, I say. You go, the other shoppers shout from the floor. So I feel around them, pay for my the store without another sneeze. Um, the next one I'm going to do is a piece called During Sex. And uh, it was published in a humor section of uh, a magazine recently. And uh, there's a reference to the Game of Thrones in here, to the Khaleesi, who was the mother of dragons in the, the TV series The Game of Thrones. And uh, the actress Amelia Clark wore um, a silver blonde wig that many men fetishized. There was a lot about the fetishizing of that wig. And um, she had a language that she used, and one of the words was Dracarys. She used that when the dragons were called to torture enemies. So they go Dracarys. Anyway, that, that, that comes in at the end of the piece. So just wanted to make sure you were here. During sex, Odalise, her eyes closed, called me Brad, meaning Brad Pitt. Since Brad Pitt has long, dirty blonde hair and is layered with all kinds of muscle, and since I'm on the flabby side, pear-shaped with black hair, always neatly combed, even during sex, I know she wasn't trying to say, I'm her Brad Pitt. I seized up immediately and got off her. I didn't like being on top anyway. She had one of those sunbeam light bulbs that felt as though it were burning the hair off my head. Why did you stop, she asked. You were imagining that Brad Pitt was on top of you, I said. She pulled the covers over her chest and sat up. Last week during sex, you called me Eliza, your first wife's name. And the week before that, with your eyes closed, in the middle of your orgasm, you shouted, Queen Bay. And then on another evening, you whispered, sing for me, Tay-Tay. I could go on. 
Enough, I said, lying on my back in the memory foam. Who was I to her, and who was she to me? Were we only the vehicles of each other's fantasies? What would happen if I imagined making love to Odalise while actually making love to Odalise? Not sure I really wanted to know. I touched her body, and she touched my face. I whispered in her ear, Khaleesi, wrenching her to me. As she rose, she pretended to shake free a shower of silver blonde hair. Her voice grew louder, more forceful, issuing commands in her native language. Dracarys, her dragons flying, breathing fire. Um, so I'm going to switch gears a little bit and um, read a piece called Lost Memory. I've been writing a lot lately about memory as I'm losing my memory. I might as well write about it, I feel like, as I'm sort of, you know, as, as I'm fading, even though I'm fading or thing, I'm just fading, period. So I thought I'd write this piece. And this, this piece grew out, of, it grew out of an argument I had with my sister. Um, and I had told her a story, not a story, I told her the truth, that when I was in second grade, I had double pneumonia, and I missed school for um, something like seven months. And my mother, fearing that the teacher would get the wrong idea that um, I wasn't doing anything, uh, but reading comic books and watching TV, invited everybody over to the house, all the students and the teacher, to, um, and then she sort of got me to memorize all the presidents of the United States. And I recited the presidents of the United States and then told a little story about them. And um, anyway, I told this to my sister. And then somehow, four months later, she told me a story about how she had double pneumonia when she was like in grade school or something. Our, she, she had double pneumonia, and, and our mother invited everybody in the class to hear her play Melaguena. And I said, I don't remember you having double pneumonia. She said, I don't remember you having double pneumonia. So anyway, we ended up in a fight over who actually had double pneumonia. They call that importing a memory, by the way, you know, when somebody does something like that. But um, so um, this is about that. It's called Lost Memory. And it was also published in Best Microfiction and as a poem as well. My sister stole a memory of mine from my house and took it home, hidden in her coat. I couldn't remember the memory, but there was an empty space on the sideboard under the window. Give me back the memory, I said, standing outside her door, and I won't report you to the authorities. She let me in. Don't be ridiculous, she said. Why would I steal a memory of yours? Didn't take me long to find the memory, a blue jar sitting on the glass stand between two chairs. When I picked it up, she looked puzzled. This is my place, she said. These are my things. Not true, I replied, and unscrewed the lid. Emptiness wafted out with its stinging scent. Now I remembered something I had wanted to forget. I screwed the lid back on quickly and set it down. That's my memory, she said. You shouldn't have opened it. Then what do you remember, I asked. Nothing. It's gone because you let it out. And as I stood there, angry at my sister, the scent of the memory evaporated. And all I could remember was the jar. And now that belonged to her. Um, let's see, I'm going to move on here to a couple of other pieces. Let's see what time it is, 16. Um, okay. I'm going to read a piece for a friend of mine who has been um, sick for about the last 10 or 12 years and has really deteriorated over that time. And I don't know that she has much more to go. But anyway, this one's called The Singer Who Lost Her Voice. The singer lost her voice, and though her lips were perfectly shaped around syllables, only breath came out. For seven days, she remained silent, gargling salt water to soothe her throat muscles. When she attempted to sing again, her voice wouldn't sound. No matter how much effort she exerted, she couldn't coax or force it out, so she made an appointment with a specialist who nodded knowingly, winked at her, and told her not to worry, that her voice would come back when she didn't expect it. After a long period of time, she didn't expect to hear her own voice anymore, so she thought that as the doctor predicted, it might return, yet it didn't. Then she went to a healer who poured warm oil down her throat. The oil soothed her throat. There was more silence. She found a witch online who said it was a curse. The witch created a spell to remove the curse that had stolen her voice. I can see your voice in the air flying toward you. Can you see it? The singer shook her head. Open your mouth and let it in. Something might have flown in her mouth. She didn't know. 
She closed her eyes and sang. Her song was soundless. The palm reader traced the deep grooves of her palm and said, you will sing again, but first you must live like a bird. What did that mean? Build a nest and live in a tree, eat only seeds and nuts, learn to fly? She moved her arms as though they were wings. She ate her food in small, quick bites. She puffed out her chest, threw back her head to sing, but couldn't even produce a whisper. Then she found a guru who had the answer. The guru prayed and chanted. He burned incense. Go home, he said. Drink this tea every night and chant these words and you will sing. Night after night, she drank her tea and chanted the prayer silently. Then one night, she stood in the mirror, a glint in her eyes. Her voice would return now. She was sure of it. She began to mouth one of her favorite songs. White butterflies streamed out, landing on the glass. Then out came rays of gold dust particles and hidden fears. The mirror clouded, then cleared. The song fell back into her throat like water swirling down a drain. She walked out of her home and looked up at the clear white moon. She steadied herself, inhaled the darkness, and from her lungs and chest, she pushed a song out with all of her might. Thousands of sparks flew into the air. So um, I've written a lot of pieces about during, that were informed by the pandemic and also that re responded in some way to the, you know, the incredibly cruel and inept Trump administration. So this is one of them, it's something that you know, was triggered by that particular moment in time. But um, this is called The Boy with Holes. The officers who shot the boy repeatedly watched him fall face first his arms and legs jerking until all movement ceased. They kept their distance, holstering their weapons, sure that it was all over. But the boy rose, his sweet face dirt stained. He walked slowly toward the officers. Light poked through the holes in his body. The ground was wet with blood. They stepped back and took out their weapons again. I've never seen anything like this before, one officer said. The other agreed. Though they told him to stop and get down on his knees, the boy kept walking until he stood so close, he touched one officer on the arm. Like a breath raising the skin, his hand felt weightless. The officer cocked his gun and held it to the boy's head. Crows gathered round them. The trees rustled. The red sun flared so intensely, they had to squint to see his shape. And then the boy vanished. Now, all they could see were the holes. And um, let's see what time it is here. Um, and I'll do one, one last piece, just do a short piece that's um, um, kind of an homage to Paul Newman. I was a big fan of Paul Newman growing up and, um, you know, as a, you know, he ate 50 eggs and cool hand Luke and, Butch Yassi and Sundance Kid, but so anyway, I was a big fan, like I said, and so um, I wrote this piece recently, somewhat recently. Um, Newman's Own. My lover thought I was Paul Newman, which is probably why she became my lover. One night in bed, I told her the truth. I'm not Paul Newman. She started to laugh. You're a joker, all right, she said. No, really. Paul Newman has blue eyes that are clear as sky. I've got dark, beady brown eyes, Hungarian eyes. He has a square jaw and I have a weak chin hidden by my beard. I never made love to Liz Taylor or Dominique Sanda or Joanne Woodward and I don't drink two six packs in two months, let alone two hours. Well, she said, your tomato sauce is pretty good. Thank you. Thank you very much. Homage, Meg, take over. Shall I remove this? Shall I remove this one? Okay. Uh, testing sounds okay? All right. Well, thank you so much. And it's an honor to be here at this beautiful library today. Um, I have a, a new collection out called 
first law of Hull's new and selected stories. I've been writing flash fiction for 15 years. I was very lucky to be there early in the form when it first started taking off of literary magazines. Originally, I was a poet, um, a sort of a narrative poet. And um, I just I find that my work in poetry for years has really informed my fiction. I'm just going to, I don't do wonderful intros like Jeff. I'm a bit shy. So I'm just going to launch into the stories. Um, and two, yeah, two are very uh, new, and then the rest of them are from this, the first law of holes. The first story is called Cure. When my hair thinned, when my face grew paler, he brought home some medicine, but it was the wrong kind again. Don't flinch, he said, rubbing my feet, not letting me inch farther and farther away. The stuff is strong, he said, his voice full of sand. I wanted to tell him that what he had given me was yet a new kind of trap. Great, I said, watching him pour it onto a spoon, the bright orange color like a floral surprise that nobody asked for. I swallowed it down and watched him watching me be a good patient. Are you good, he asked. Very good, I said. He stood there in his tall black turtleneck, counting the seconds until my recovery. It's taking a while, I said. Now there were purple clouds poking in through our steamed up windows, filling the room with the feeling that rain was about to spill. He smiled, a magical kind of smile that made me feel as if I could glimpse my old self, as if she were standing in the doorway, not flinching at what I had become. Beautiful and young in the doorway, like a star blinking out in my mind. And the next piece is called Hooked. Uh, it's told from the point of view of a young child with a, with a difficult father relationship. And it's, uh, yeah, OK, Hooked. And that was the time Papa hooked me on the way to school. I was running late, and he said, let's go the other way, guppy, because the day was too cheerful for school. And Papa was holding my hand, saying his new life adventure was ready to begin. And I had a part in it. He sure had a lot to tell me when I noticed the stains on his shoes, the blotches on his shirt, and said to him, are you doing OK? And he said, your mama is not very kind, not like you. And he held my hand tight as a rose, and I could feel the petals on his fingers bending to mine. And I said, that was fine and dandy by me. I hated school anyway. And he said, Guppy, I have purchased a big old fish, and the poor fish needs to be eaten today, or it will, it will rot from neglect. And I said, yay, he knows I like fish, and mama does not. What does it taste like, I asked. Is it white or is it pink? It's good and firm, he said, just the way a fish tastes when you catch it before it's full grown. So I laughed, and I let him lead me home to his sad old fish, to his house with paintings of girls like me all over his walls. And I stood there feeling jiggly, almost glad to be back with him. I was his daughter again. Whatever she said to me didn't matter. And that was how it happened. That was how I became a fish who never knows what ocean it wants to swim in. Some of these are very short stories, about four or 500 words. Um, I also wanted to say, I, I start, before I was a, into poetry, studying poetry, I was in theater. I studied acting from age eight to age 26. I've recently been doing some interviews about how I think being an actor also informed my work. Um, it's, it's really interesting. It's kind of a blend of, of things. OK, the next story is called Villa Monterey Apartment Burbank. And my big sister was an actress. She was a well-known TV actress when I was growing up. She was 14 years older. And this is a sort of autobiographical-ish story about seeing her for the first time in Los Angeles when I was a little girl visiting her. In California, the earth shakes, Ma said yesterday, crossing an invisible line from Nevada into California. She pushed the gas pedal hard, and the car almost jumped. I clapped for her. Today, Ma's meeting with a real estate company to ask for a job, so I get to stay at Tanya's apartment and swim. Tanya is the beauty in the family, 14 years older than me. She has a bronzed face, streaked hair, is addicted to the soundtrack from West Side Story. Her boyfriend, an actor named Sam, smiles at me. He has dark muscles, swimming shorts, Popeye's shoulders stretching out against her avocado shag rug. He just got a part in a TV show. Can you walk on my back with your little bare feet, honey? Sam asks. 
My dad was old and I, I know he always looked hurt. I'd hurt him by being so little and clumsy. Once he taught me a lesson about it and I never touched him again. Maybe Sam doesn't know how bad I am. Tanya won't talk about dad, she hates him so much. So I pretend I never knew him when I'm with her. Don't make her do that, Sam. Tanya barks, a hundred years crawling into her voice. Oh, come on, she's just a kid, he says, blowing air. I don't want to hurt you, I say. He stays quiet, waiting. Stepping on him feels soft, hard, squishy. You win, Tanya says, you both fucking win. Tanya is so much older than when she left home to become famous a year ago. She walks out swishing a bright red towel behind her. She's going swimming. A kid can't hurt me, he says. In the pool, they don't talk with words, just touch each other's faces, bobbing up and down in the deep end. I pretend it's a movie. Seven short palm trees stand in a line behind the pool deck as if waiting for autographs. Mom once told me smog is invisible once you're in it, and she's right. Everything sparkles in Burbank. The vacancy sign on the apartment building, Sam's neon goggles, the lines of water cascading from my sister's bloodshot eyes. And the last piece I'm reading is called The Producer. It's a little bit longer. It's written in sections. The producer, the 90-year-old producer, had a hole in his heart, a shaky, unpatchable hole. He wanted me to fill it with kisses, candy, and jokes. I handed him a travel-sized Mars bar that I got on the plane. Only a monkey, he said, would offer this old sack of bones a gift from the red planet. He said this because of my newly red hair. He liked to run his skinny fingers through it. I called him the producer because he'd always told me he wanted to produce a movie. Sometimes he asked me to write one told me to create a character role just for him and to make him younger, less shaky, without Parkinson's, less married. That was easy as I imagined him a younger person. The nickname Monkey rubbed off on me. There was a gullible monkey on my shoulder, enjoying the stories he told me about his horrible home life, how his wife carried a loaded pistol around the house, even in her PJs. She never puts it away anymore, he winked. What a horrible person she was, I told myself, kissing his shivery lips. Well, that blouse is very flattering, flattering on you, the producer said, his face half fallen. It was the same blouse I'd worn every other night in the dining room. I wondered if he had had a mini stroke in his sleep. Half of his face looked younger than the other half, less perceptive. He gazed at me as if I alone provided gravity. The hotels we stayed in had very good food. We would eat in the dining rooms and middle-aged businessmen would stare with disgusted expressions as the two of us nibbled appetizers and sipped rhubarb gin. They thought he had to be a great uncle or a grandfather. So why was I wearing such a low cut decadent blouse? Why were his eyes gripping the rise of my cleavage as if he was pulling himself from some brackish lake? He's a producer and I'm in love with him, I wanted to say. Give me a break, I didn't have a dad, I wanted to scream. They would offer me a weak nod as if to say, well, if he croaks tonight, I'm around. My story is filled with love tragedies and I told the producer all of them. You should write a screenplay about them, he said, and this really cheered me up. My strong young boyfriends would eventually say that they saw our relationship as a weakness. I never knew what they meant. Their muscular legs would take off for runs or bike rides in the early morning. They were running away from me, my mother once said, because often they didn't return. For example, my young husband disappeared after going for a long, mindful, ultra run. I like the look of that path, he said, and I never saw him again. I knew there were mountain lions around, but they never found his bones. Thankfully, I heard from him just a few years later. He wrote me a postcard from Jakarta to say that his knees, hips, and spine had finally given out. That's what unhappiness does, he wrote. By the time I turned 27, I was tired of the young ones, their perfect bodies, and their deeply unsatisfied souls. When I first met the producer, I arrived at a hotel with my dog. I was still married, but my husband had been missing for a year. When the producer hugged me in the lobby of the hotel, I tried not to cry. You are tattered and shabby, he said, or maybe I imagined it. His skin was yellow and fragile to the touch. I like your face, I said. I like your dog, he said. We took the elevator up to his hotel room and he put on a Lucinda Williams song. He had an iPad that he didn't know how to use. He said the one thing he was confident about was a music app. Somehow I can always make it sing, he said. The song that plays in my head now, when I remember the producer, is something about what happens when we talk. I felt it was corny the first time he played it for me, but now that he's gone, I miss the talks we had. How much you like my dog. 
and how it felt as if he was calling to me from someplace close but very far away. The last time I saw him, he perched on the sofa of our hotel room as if he was ready to fly. We are not the same age, he said. This seemed like an obvious fact and one that might have already been noted. I'm not worried about it, I said, are you? I took his hand and it was cold. I wanted to say, please don't fret about nonsense. I yanked him off the sofa and right into my arms. We danced to Lucinda Williams. I felt sad that he had said it and was shivering a bit. He held me tight as a 20 year old, but felt as light as a paper doll. So weightless, I could have carried him home in my arms. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Sure, yeah, okay, yeah. Is that okay? We're going to go back. Yeah. No, it's okay, I'll stand up. I've been sitting down too much. Um, so, um, let me just find what I have here. Um, Meg and I have been, uh, since the beginning of the pandemic, we read together at the beat, sort of at the beginning of the pandemic, the very beginning, we did a reading on Lit Youngstown. And the host for that reading asked us all, the three people, Denise Stuhamel was the other one, to um, exchange work and ask each other questions. So we kind of did it. Meg started writing me, emailing me some questions. And I started emailing her back. And it grew into us emailing well beyond the reading. We were emailing each other almost every day. And I remember kind of going somewhere and going, God, I didn't get an email from Meg. I'm a little <laughs> disappointed, you know. And, um, then it turned into us Zooming, and we started Zooming and having these great, fun conversations about all the things we'd like to write. Um, and we had all these great ideas, which we actually never wrote. Some of those would be really great to get down. But anyway, we began to working on, um, working on a book together. Or working on, she, you proposed me, you asked me. Yes, I proposed to you. Yes, she yes. asked me to write a book with her, and I said yes. So we started trying to, um, Meg, Meg took one of my pieces and she wrote her version of one of my pieces. Then I wrote my version of her version of one of my pieces. Then she wrote her version of my version of her version of one of my pieces. And it went like that for a while. And then we go, this has got to stop because <laughs> nobody's going to want to read all yeah. the versions. So then we tried some other ideas like, you know, uh, she would write the first paragraph and I'd write the rest of it. And eventually it got down to um, I was teaching and she was she would write a line or two, and then I would write a line or two, and she would write a line, sort of exquisite core technique where we'd go back and forth. And that was our primary technique. And I think the thing about it was that we agreed, you know, tactically. We never said anything at reach to the beginning, we, but we just improv, improvise and not correct ourselves. So she would write something, and I would never correct it, never say, this isn't any good. I would just run with it. And same thing. Yeah. Same thing with her. So same technique as improvisational theater. Yeah, yeah. You brought that too. You don't ever say no. You just yeah. say yes. Yeah. So, so we were we were doing that. So we did our first book, The House of Granite Padano, that way. Um, could you just hand me the book? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. I'll just I'll just show it for you. Yeah. So this is it. this was it. It was such a fun book to work on. I have to say. So <laughs> Meg, we we got this idea about doing a Chagall. Uh, you know, the two of us in a Chagall painting. And so she kind of modeled it on one. She designed, you know, actually kind of designed this to some extent. Then I said, let's amendlinate the background so we don't get sued by Chagall. <laughs> and so we changed the background. And anyway, that began that. So then we are, we're now working on our second book, which we were tempted to call New and Selected, but we just kind of stuck with it. It's, we haven't, Bald in Barcelona is the name of the new. And we changed our technique a little bit mm -hmm. to, when we write now, we kind of are doing all of it at the same time together. So she'll write a line, I'll write a line, and then we might even edit it right there if we don't like something or say, get rid of that, let's do this. We work on a live Google Doc. Yeah, yeah. Right where we actually see each other writing sentences. Yeah, so it's like, it's so collaborative, you know, it's, it, it, and it, all of this really helped during the pandemic because it kind of broke the isolation of writing and the isolation period to have something to look forward to and something really creative. So I'm going to read, um, uh, uh, we're going to read, start out with two pieces from, and maybe that's all we'll do because I um, wouldn't want um, anybody to get tired out, but we're going to start out with two pieces from our bald man section. So we have a whole section of, of bald man pieces and the title of the manuscript is called Bald in Barcelona. 
So some are sort of serious bald pieces and some are sort of your humorous bald pieces. But, but you know, they have a sense of humor about them. Anyway, the, the one I'm going to read is called Facts About Bald Men. Um, and it's set up like there's spaces between, you know, it's like statements with sta spaces between them. Okay. Bald men flare like matchsticks, lighting up the caves around them. When they sit down to eat, their baldness sits with them. They chew so vigorously, their temples pulse. They buy fancy hats to cover their baldness, but they doff their hats and bow to show it off. When bald men put their heads together, they are like a dozen eggs cracking against each other. Occasionally, bald men discover a curl of hair growing from their thoughts. They shave off a little scalp to remove the stubble. Bald heads shine like chrome heb crabs, like Spanish onions, like scoops of vanilla ice cream, like icebergs riding high in the water, their crests melting. Bald men renounce Samson as their forefather because he was tricked into baldness. They trace their lineage to Leviathan, who had scales but no hair and ruled the primordial seas. Bald men are mirrors for other bald men, moons in a dark sky, pools of grief glistening with tiny fish. Take it, bald mistress. <laughs> oh, can I, can I just, okay. So, um, <laughs> from the chair. Um, okay, I'll read one called, it's another bald man piece called Prayer for Hair. Prayer for Hair. He had prayed for months to get his hair back, and when he did, he was sorry. It resembled Alaskan tundra, dry and crinkly in patches, growing fast. His bald head had been noticeable, but not in a bad way. His was robust, like a perfect pumpkin. His wife, who at first seemed upset by it, had become so fond of it that she thought of it as her child. Now he had hair, but not beautiful like a Malamute's or a Husky's, <laughs> not beautiful like a man 10 years before he's going to go bald, but like a frozen plot of ground in which his wife's treasure is buried. In the middle of the night, he would hear his wife crying like a wolf and wondered if she was remembering his lost beauty. He prayed to lose his hair again, but nothing happened. What kind of cruel trick is this, he wondered. He remembered how much she had loved to massage his baldness until his skin felt warm as if there were a sun beneath it. How their marriage had finally become full and round as if it were made for his head. Right, so should we do another? Uh, one, last, a, one last bald. Let's piece. do one more bald. Yeah, piece you piece. could do your, your next okay. bald piece. Okay, at the bald man, at the bald men society clubhouse. You're not bald enough, Bob the president told Elias, whose whole <laughs> dome was empty of hair, but not his sidewalls. There was not a speck of stubble of hair, there was not a speck or stubble of hair to be found on the president's glowing lump of head. It was a cool night in the desert, and the moon was full, but it did not cheer Elias up. He needed a support group, people to share his stories with about baldness. He remembered the line about how you wouldn't actually want to belong to a club that wanted you as a member. He may have believed that at one time, but he hadn't gotten laid in over a year, and his ex-wife used his photo as a target for darts. The president looked down on him as if he were a hairy wheel of cheese. He shook his head. We can't accept pretenders. But Bob, he said, you're my brother. Bob placed his hand on Elias's shoulder and shoved him out the door. Elias stumbled toward a family of tall, spiky cacti, their wispy hair blowing around in the dark. I'll, I'll read the last one, which is the title of our new collection, Bald in Barcelona. <laughs> He'd been bald for many years and had grown used to seeing his pate grow dimmer and dimmer in the mirrors. But the tonic had given him a head of lustrous black hair. He could hear the full-throated birds in the neighborhood bursting into flight outside the dining room window. The trees outside the window were so full of leaves he couldn't even see the sky. A dog he'd never heard bark barked so loudly as if, as if he owned the neighborhood. He could feel the blood rising to his head, the hair seeming to grow another inch even as he stood there taking in the new morning. The phone buzzed against his hip. A sexy woman he had been too embarrassed to ask out was calling. He answered the phone with a vibrant, thick-haired hola, as if he were a Spanish celebrity. 
drinking his morning espresso. In response, she answered in Spanish and began laughing as if they had just met and were falling in love. He didn't understand a word of what she was saying, but he felt her sunny voice warming the roots of his hair, his hair like a nest of happiness. I'm coming over now, my Toro, she cooed, and I will be wearing red. When he opened the door, she kissed him hard on the lips, reached up to grab his hair, and within seconds, he was bald again. Okay, so, so we have in the, in the just, to, just to finish up with like the statement about it, like that the new book has like five long sequences in it. So this is one of, there's a mother-son sequence and there's a pet loss and lover sequence. So, um, and, and the other two, you know, a glow section and uh, what's the other one? There's one other one that yes. is slipping my mind. Either, but, right at the yes. but anyway, so we've done them all in long sequences. The bald, bald men, Barcelona, at least the longest of the sequences thus far, so. We like bald men. Yes. Well, you know, I, I, I'm the example of one. So um, anyway, this has been lovely being here. And yeah, thanks again, thank Liza. Thank you so much, Liza. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.